chapter number 12. Amen. And we are uh, continuing in this series on revolutionary living and uh, looking very uh, intently at uh, what does it mean for us as followers of Jesus to take seriously the revolutionary aspects of the gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, also uh, using the book of Acts as a, 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 a source and a resource for us to imagine how then should we and can we live. How then should we and can we live? Now many of you know the book of Acts is a continuous record of the early church, uh, their efforts to take the gospel and the message of Jesus and to actually make it concrete uh, in the culture and in the society that in many ways was not uh, Christian, right? It wasn't a place where people had even heard this message before. And the uh, book of Acts written by uh, the same individual who wrote the gospel according to Luke. Many people believe that he took uh, many of these uh, best records and eyewitness testimonies of Peter and Paul and others that compiled a two-volume record of not only the life of Jesus, but the life of the early church. So over the last several months, we've been moving throughout the book of Acts, looking at the early church and how the Spirit fell upon many of them, and ordinary people began to do extraordinary things. And uh, I don't know uh, how that makes you feel, but it certainly is exciting to know that God can use ordinary folk. Amen. Sometimes we feel like you got to have all these degrees, or you got to have all this money, or you got to have this big old platform. But how do you know God can use anybody who's open to being used? And the Spirit is also wanting to heal parts of our lives that may be broken. So not only does God want to use us, but God wants to make us whole. And then we talked a little couple weeks ago about how God is trying to unite us across all of our differences. So not only does God want to use us, not only does God want to heal us, but God wants to unite us. And this is one of the great, I think, gifts of this gospel uh, as we preach and teach and learn and understand it, is that uh, Jesus is really interested in, in uh, redeeming and restoring the world uh, to God's original intent. And uh, because the world is not uh, where God wanted to be, uh, time after time, a revolution is always necessary. And I'm so thankful that many of us, if not all of us, are engaged in the Jesus revolution. And uh, my prayer is that as we continue to go through this series, you all will uh, imagine what does it mean to live revolutionary according to the ways of Christ. Acts chapter 12, verse number 1, then, is where we'll sit down in this text today and uh, do some exploration. Uh, the words of the scripture, verse number 1, read along these lines. About that time, King Herod laid violent hands upon some who belonged to the church. And he had James, the brother of John, killed with the sword. And after he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the festival of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison and handed him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. While he was kept in prison, the church prayed fervently to God for him. And that very night before Herod was going to bring him out, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers. And while guards in front of the door were keeping watch over the prison, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. Tapped Peter on the side and woke him saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his wrists. The angel said to him, fasten your belt, put on your sandals. He did so. Then he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter went out and followed him. He did not realize that what was happening with the angel's health was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. After they had passed the first and the second guard, they came before the iron gate leading into the city and it 
open for them of its own accord, and they went outside, walked along the lane, when suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter said to himself, or came to himself and said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all the Jewish people were expected. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. Be to God. Verse number 7 says that Peter, while he was on the side, the angel tapped him, told him, get up quickly, and the chains fell off his wrists. I'm going to preach to you from the topic today, let's lose our chains. Let's lose our chains. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God that is read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. Send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me. Even the hearers of this word, in Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Tell your neighbor, let's lose our chains. Tell them that. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I can lose my chain. Now, all of you know that uh, life is filled with many challenges and circumstances that often can feel or be out of our control. And it is indeed the case that depending on where you are in life and what you're dealing with, uh, we can respond in different ways to challenges as they come. Part of what I am excited about when I read this scripture, when I think of what I believe God wants us to consider, is God is not pleased or is it the will of God for us to be living in bondage. God seeks to set us free. God wants you and I to be free. People who are free to realize and actualize the greatness that God has placed inside of each and every one of us. And make no mistake about it, child of God. God has put something inside of you that is great. God has put something inside of you that no one can hold back. When you begin to move in the ways of God, God puts something inside of you that sometimes make folks who may be a little smaller than you uncomfortable. Because folks can easily be intimidated by greatness. And when you understand what God has put inside of you, child of God, then part of what our task and your task is, is to make sure that you do not allow yourself to be in bondage. Right. And there are all kinds of bondage we can talk about that I think would resonate with many of us today. Some of us are in emotional bondage. Some of us have psychological bondage. Some of us, physical bondage. Some of us uh, are uh, bound to addictions and behaviors and ways of living and being. Some of us uh, have relational bondage and it's impacting the way we interact with our husbands and our wives and our children and our loved ones and our friends and our family members. And whatever kind of bondage it is, I want you to know that God is not uh, trying to allow you to stay in any bondage. Because the Bible says when the Son is set free, God wants you to be free indeed. But be clear, sometimes bondage is a reality. Bondage of things that get latched onto us sometimes without our own permission. Sometimes you can bitch be a, 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 a victim of other people's foolishness and machinations and, and schemes. Sometimes that can cause you to end up in a place where you know you did not deserve to be there. I have a witness in the house today. Amen. Regardless of where you find yourself, if there's one thing I want you to understand today is the God you serve has the power, even in the middle of your difficulty, to set you free. 
And God wants you to be free. God needs you to be free. Because how many know when you're free, you can do a lot more than if you were bad? I can't help but continue to be deeply overwhelmed by all of the many different forms of bondage that manifest themselves in our communities. The ways in which there's gun violence, the ways in which the incarceration, the ways in which all of these uh, social ills seem to have latched onto many of us or our loved ones and, and they seem to not want to let us go. It is indeed, I think, a point of fact that some of us uh, are more used to being bound than we are to being free. I know some brothers, some here who at the church have been uh, used to being incarcerated more than they are to being free. And I know some of us who feel like, well, you know, as long as I'm not in jail, then I'm free. How do you know you can be out of jail and still be in my Because sometimes it's not the jail cell that you got to be free from, it's your mental. Hello, somebody. Man, I find it fascinating. I used to work with some of the young people uh, a lot more closely uh, when we were at the school, and, and uh, many of the young guys would just tell me, you know, Pastor Mike, I've never been to San Francisco. I said, why have you never been? I don't go over there. I was like, why? Because, you know, I, I don't belong there. I belong here in South Berkeley, here in West Berkeley. This is just where I belong. And, you know, it's fascinating because no one is outlawing them from going anywhere. But circumstances have caused them to believe that this sliver of street in this town is where they belong. That you can not be physically in Santa Rita or San Quentin, but you can still be in jail. Right. <laughs> and for some of us who've never been to San Quentin, Santa Rita, God bless you, but you still find yourself in jail. The jails of racism, the jails of sexism, the jails of poverty, and all of these different chains that would like to grab you by the arms and the legs and keep you down. But I got good news for you today. And the good news is not new news. As a matter of fact, it's kind of old news. And for some of us, it's not news you haven't heard before. Some of us, it's just process being reminded again and again and again that if God has delivered you, can nobody put you or keep you in those chains. Yeah. And I want to tell you some people that uh, the sooner you and I realize that these chains that are on us can't hold us, the sooner victory comes to our house. The sooner victory comes to our community. When we begin to fully understand that even the chain that people will try to put on us can't hold us because we have a power in us that's greater than the power that's outside of us. a couple of things, uh, particularly when we look at this text in Acts chapter 12, that Peter, the primary character that we've been talking about the last couple weeks, uh, seems to always find himself in some trouble. And he's not in trouble for doing the wrong thing, he's in trouble for doing God's will. And it just is an interesting principle that you should just kind of highlight in your mind. Because some people will tell you that trouble only comes your way when you're doing the wrong thing. That you can be doing the right thing and trouble will come and find you. Hello, somebody. Now, the interesting thing about human nature is that we are easily able to say that the reason why I'm in a bad situation is because of somebody else's, you know, doing something to me. I was watching Jesse Ventura, uh, you know, he, he got this book about conspiracies. 
And how many know we, we, we the kings and queens of conspiracy, praise God. So, some of it is well-founded, some of it is grounded in, in some reality. But I want to submit to you that uh, not every problem that you find yourself in is because of somebody else. So it's just good to try to, you know, have a little truth-telling serum in your life somewhere. And be able to discern when the trouble you in is because of some decisions you made and or because of the decision that someone else has made in response to you doing the will of God. Now, whether either one of those are the case is not, a, is not the determining factor of if God brings deliverance into your life. Tell me, know God is the deliverer whether you are the reason or not. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. God, God is not discriminatory about when he's going to deliver. Amen. God's not like, well, I'm, I'm you know, McBride, you, you don't step into that one, so I'll just let you figure that out on your own. Amen. Uh, I don't know. You know I, I, I wish I had a few witnesses that could just, just be honest and say, uh, I stepped into it, but God took me out. Praise God. I know I shouldn't have gave him my heart, but God brought me out of it. I shouldn't have gave her my money, but God brought me out of it. I shouldn't have took that job, but God brought me out. I shouldn't have went to that party. I, I can listen. I go on and on. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him God brought me out of it. Amen. Because God wants us to lose our chains. And we, God takes the chains away. It's just important for you and I not to go back and put the chains back on. Now, in the text, I believe there are a few principles that can be very helpful for us to understand how we lose these chains. I call it a nexus of deliverance. A nexus of deliverance. This intersection, if you will, of, of ways in which I believe God intends to bring about our salvation, our deliverance, the process of us losing our chain. And I want to submit to you that there's always a nexus at work in every part of our life. Don't buy the simplistic theories out here that seem to pervade our culture, our politics, and our society that will make you think that the reason for all of our problems is because of one thing. Amen. There are a lot of things that are feeding the nexus of misery in this country. I was listening to the O'Reilly fella and the, 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 the Don Lemon and, and all these folks post trade about Martin. And they love to talk about how all the problems of the black community, of poor communities, of immigrant communities are all problems that we should solve. As if these challenges were created only by us. You should resist those kind of simplistic analyses. How many of you know there ain't one thing that could really, uh, you know, give an account for all of the misery that's going on in this country? Don't you know that there are about half of our country is in, like, uh, on the brink of poverty? Yes. They'll call it the working poor. Mm -hmm. And that's not because half the country is lazy. Because we got some crooked folks. Somebody say crooked folk. Crooked folk. Crooked folk who are outside of our view that seem to be so greedy that some of these crooked folk is in our view. All right now. We just don't know what to do about it. Amen. I'll keep hanging around. We'll tell you a few things. Amen. But, 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 but the point here is that there's a nexus of responsibility that I think all of us should share. I believe in personal responsibility. I believe in social responsibility. I believe in, in communal responsibility. I believe in national responsibility. I believe in divine responsibility. Praise God. Then there's a collective responsibility for all of us to do. And I'm finding that when we take care of what we're supposed to do, and God takes care of what God's supposed to do, and the community takes care of what the community's supposed to do, then deliver But when we always waiting on God, yeah. mm. while we living our lives the same way, yeah. 
then you're delaying the chains to come off. Or when you think it's all within your own power, you don't need God. You delaying the chains coming off. Or when you think that uh, the community uh, has no role or has all the role, then we're delaying the process of the chains coming off because I believe the nexus of deliverance requires all of us to do this thing together. So when I think of this nexus of deliverance in this passage, I I'll give you three ways that I I I'll, I'll try to unpack for us here today. The first uh, way that I think is so critical when we talk about this nexus is it requires some personal activity. The second thing, it requires some communal activity. And the third thing, it requires some divine activity. Everybody say personal, personal. Communal, communal, and divine. Yeah. When all three of these are working, deliverance is at its most transformative manner. And our world has a whole lot of things going on in that require a nexus response. So here in Acts chapter 12, we, we find a context that is very similar to our own. We have state-sponsored violence. We have uh, uh, King Herod out here laying hands on folk and putting them in jails and killing folk uh, because of the work that they are doing. And how many of you know we live in a country that is an extremely violent country? Country that perpetrates violence both at home and abroad. We have a country that can drop bombs on families in poor countries. We have a country that has state-sponsored violence against its own citizens every 28 hours. A person is killed by the police here in our own country. Whether they're guilty or innocent, the life is still gone. In our own communities, we 30 some folk dying every day. Yeah. Because of murder, folks so angry and upset that we feel like we're justified to take one another's lives. Wow. Very similar context to Acts chapter 12. A bloodthirsty culture. In, in these times, they would fill up coliseums and watch uh, individuals being uh, fed to the lions and tigers, and they would have all these kind of of sports where where blood would just run onto the ground and people would cheer. Very similar to how we all go to the movies and watch these shoot 'em up movies or listen to all this music where ain't nothing but just negativity pouring into our ears and we all cheer. Spend our hard earned money to be entertained by debauchery and violence. Some folks say, well, you know, uh, your community just need to take responsibility. I had a pastor tell me this. Well, Pastor Mike, if your community stop making all that music and buying it, then that thing we better. I told him, well, don't you know the same percent of all the hip hop that's being bought is being bought by folk in Idaho? Yeah. <laughs> the Dakotas, praise God. Now, I'm not saying we're not up there, but we ain't 70% of the folk up there. That it's a national problem. That we are a culture and a people that love violence. And they are chains that are around our arms and our legs. And we can't ever be free. We're a culture that is bound by racial fragmentation and polarization. And we despise folk unconsciously and consciously based off of how much money folk have, the color of their skin. And we have assumptions that keep us from being able to live a life free from these chains. And child of God, I want you to know that one of the great gifts of scripture is that we aren't the first group of folk to have all these problems. See, a lot of folk will, you know, want to think that the Bible's so irrelevant. You read that old ancient thing, you know, made up stories, people trying to put you in bondage. You know, uh, it's the opiate for the masses, praise God. I just think that, you know, uh, when you really take the text seriously, it ain't an opiate. This thing ain't going to put you to sleep, praise God, if you take it seriously. Now, you know, you take, you, if you don't take it seriously, maybe it will put you to sleep. 
because who wants to read these, thighs, and those all the time? Yeah. How many know anything can put you to sleep? Amen. This politics can put you to sleep. Your shopping can put you to sleep. Your food can put you to sleep. I'm talking about you got the items. <laughs> Yeah. 
God for these new parents and praise God. But anyway, <laughs>
It says that once Peter got free, he went to the place where they were praying. Now, Trent, the church was praying, but they weren't at church. Not like what we call it, because they had church in their homes. So all you folks that don't go to live group, don't go meet with folks in homes, because you hung up on being here at the church. You missing out on the rest. Oh, I'm fine. 